Welcome to Empire Building, where we talk about building a big business and an even bigger life. I'm Via Williams. I'm Seychelle Van Poole. I'm Wendy Papazan. And I'm Sarah Reynolds. And today we are going to talk about how to plan, make decisions, and then act and pivot. I don't know about you guys, but so many things are being thrown at me. And even for the fastest person, this is certainly a lot. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in on how to create a framework for planning. How are you guys creating your framework right now in terms of planning? I love that, Sarah, because I know a lot of people are struggling to make decisions right now when everything else in your life feels completely overwhelming. The idea of actually shifting your business around and trying to adapt and do all that just feels extremely tiring. So I just love to hear what you guys are doing to really create a system for making decisions right now because making the correct decisions is really crucial. I think for me, it's like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So like the first thing is, you know, is the fire going to burn the house down? Because if the fire is going to burn the house down, there's no point in remodeling the kitchen, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. So so for me, you know, we, we have to, before we even get to priorities, we kind of have to go to, you could use a ship as an example. You know, where are the leaks that we have to plug so that the ship doesn't sink? And we have to kind of go from there first. And so I think that before you even get into priorities, you have to kind of talk about how do you even decide the priorities? And, and it's just a constant triage of, you know, what is it going to take to keep keep the ship floating or the house from burning first? Yes. Yeah. Many of us are going to more of like a 30-day planning uh, versus decision-making versus um before we had maybe a quarter planned out, six months planned out, or a year planned out. So reducing it down to 30 days versus longer term has helped me a lot. I think the other thing that I keep looking at too is what can I control? I think there's a lot of decisions that we would like to be able to make, but you're not in control of it. Many even industries completely shut down right now. And so when you have an outside factor like that, that is um, controlling some of the things you can and can't do, I'm having to narrow my decisions down to, is this going to affect something I can control or not right now? Well, I think for us, it's becoming really crystal clear about what our goal is. You know, what do we want to achieve in the next 30 days? And for most of us, it's really making sure that uh, some kind of revenue is occurring and what are the activities that are going to be around that. So that's really where we started, which is, let's look at what we're already doing and what's working and let's probably double that. And then are there things that we can do in light of what's going on that maybe set us apart from our competitors? Yeah, so... So step one, what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is keep the end goal in mind. So step one with making decisions right now is making sure that we have our end goal of what we're wanting to achieve in mind, right? And making sure we're focusing on what that is and that will help give clarity onto what we sh- should be focusing on. I, I know one of the things that I've watched Via do during this time is getting input from her people uh, when she needs to make a decision versus just reacting immediately, but getting different people's input. So Via, I would love for you to touch on how you're doing that, getting people in your organization's input. You know, it's it's interesting because in retrospect, I think that I was doing it all wrong before. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, it takes a pandemic to get me to figure some things out. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. Everyone laughs because they know me. Here, here's, here's what's happened. You know, in retrospect, I realized I was listening to the loudest voice for sure. And, and I, I look back and I think I was probably making some decisions based on one loud voice, maybe two. And and what I've really trained myself to do over the last you know month since a uh, world crisis hit is is I very much now am purposeful about getting input from a whole bunch of different people. And in my world, it's I have thirteen hundred agents that that are in my brokerages that I lead, and so I make sure I'm getting opinions from different geographic areas, from different levels of production of agents, right? from one agent that might specialize in luxury and another agent that might specialize in rural property and an agent who specializes in condos. And I'm really careful to make sure that I'm getting a really good matrix of input before I go and and make a decision or advise my CEO that we should make a decision together on something. And and it's probably one of the many habits, you guys, that that I'm going to adopt as a result of this. I'm not going to stop doing this because I realize now that you know, the softer voice can sometimes be more accurate than the loud voice. 
Well, <clears throat> Sophia, that's awesome. And you run a brokerage. You have the luxury of running a brokerage with 1,300 voices that you can tap into. <laughs> but uh, a lot of those, a lot of our listeners out there, they don't have that luxury, right? They don't have that ability. And so what would you guys recommend for you know, the small business owner who's got three to four employees and maybe, you know, they're not tapped into a big network like that. I mean, what would you, what would you recommend? So I, f- I find myself really thankful that over the last five years, we have, the four of us have been a part of a tribe of 11 of us, right? That all are in similar industries, different geographic areas, and truly different life cycles in our businesses. Um, but we can talk a similar language of business ownership and if if I didn't have a, a large enough team or a group that I trusted inside of my organization, I feel like that tribe of 11 has been really powerful for me to gain almost black hat outsider thinking that there's no way I would have come up with on my own and some of the decisions you guys have helped me make or saved me from making truly, even, I mean, just as recent as a month ago really have changed the way that I look at business. And I think if you don't have that group, this is the time to start looking for that group immediately because we're all in the same boat together. Um, and, and acquiring that tribe through a private Facebook group or a group chat or a Zoom meeting or whatever you want to do, but getting that group together so you can start getting a group of trusted advisors would really help right now. Yeah. Well, and I think your your lesson is it doesn't have to be somebody in your town right and and i think we're realizing especially with zoom that we can have these relationships all over the world and so yeah you're right how, how are you can connect right now so so we want to make sure that we are calmly getting input and versus reacting and of course starting with that big goal at the, at the end and then really focusing on third would be uh, probably laying out the facts so what are the actual facts of the situation when we have to make a decision versus like there's right now a lot of emotions tied to things and I don't know about you guys, but it can get difficult for me to to really... I have to be on purpose to basically, what are the emotions here? And then what are the facts that will help in my decision making? What are some examples of, of sort of breaking that out in terms of like facts versus like the emotion behind a decision? Well, I mean, I think you even look at um, some of the shelter in place orders that have been going into place, right? And the misinformation going around that. And... Uh, you know, you can look at that with local municipalities saying like business is shut down completely and the emotion behind, oh my gosh, I can't do anything, right? That's yeah. a huge emotional reaction. And yes. I think I think the facts are that business, how we have done it traditionally is shut down in some areas, but business moving forward as a fact is not. And you you have to take a look at how do I do business as usual, but done differently, right? And the fact is I've got to do that. Yeah, and I love, you know, Sarah, you were sharing your affirmation, which is basically that. Do you want to share your affirmation? Yeah, the, the market's not going to determine if we're successful. The market's going to determine how we're, how we are successful. And so it starts with, with knowing to get to the how, we have to then go through this sort of process of, of decision-making and, and looking at facts and things like that, and then move into action. That is where one, one of the best, things that I think about probably daily and my team hears pretty regularly. Um, Mark Cuban said once that perfection is the enemy of progress. And right now, saying and doing something is way more important than doing nothing perfectly, right? Um, we're going to get on there. We're going to update people about the market. We might make a mistake of, as to what we say, but we're saying something. We're showing what's going on, right? Um, and so it's so, so important to do that. Take action. You know, Sarah, Andy Stanley, who you and I both follow, he defines leadership and he all, it's one of my favorite things he says. He says, a leader isn't the person with the idea or with the best idea. The leader is the person who acts on what they see. And I think that, I think that that's so important. And just to kind of drill down on this a little bit, here's how I think, this is my, my framework in my head when I'm, when I'm making decisions especially now, you guys, especially now. I think to myself, all right, what can I control today with the end in mind? So today is Thursday. If today is Thursday, I make Thursday decisions on Thursday. I don't make Friday decisions on Thursday. What I do is I make Thursday decisions on Thursday because I'm about to have 10,000 data points of information given to me over the next 24 hours. And Friday is going to be a new day and it might completely be a different decision than I made today on Thursday, 
That's what I know, right? Yeah. And so we have to always focus on a very basic level of here's reality and we face reality head on and what can I control in that reality and what are the decisions that I can control today with the information I have the best way I can. Something else I'm hearing you say too, Via, is a really powerful phrase that I hear a lot of you using of, here's what's going to happen next. Not here's what's going to happen in 30 days or in 60 days or in 90 days, but just today, the decision we're making is X and here is what's going to happen next, right? And we don't worry about anything beyond that one next step, but you have to take the step. Yeah. And for those of us in leadership, you know, too, I think it's really important that we bring our people along in the journey and that we get them to to buy, buy off on that. And so I have to say it all the time to them. Hey guys, what we're going forward and doing today on Thursday may change tomorrow. And so they hear it so many times that they're understanding that we're just, we all have to pivot and we all have to be flexible. So what are you guys seeing out there in terms of like what businesses are doing or maybe what your businesses that you guys are doing that's just, that's different? That's that's kind of breaking yourself out of the, you know, the norm? One of my favorite examples is actually a, a local business owner here in Dallas. Her name is uh, Julie McCullough and she owns a um, like a luxury custom clothing line of women's dresses called Harkins Back. And uh, she actually doubled her retail space um, and moved into it at uh, the end of February. Perfect timing, right? For her dress launch at the end of March. Um, and, you know, her average retail of her average dress is like $200. Well, do you think anyone is going to go out and spend $200 on a custom dress that's just launching in the next month, right? It's not. And uh, when she heard there was a need for masks being made, she took 100% of all of the fabric that she was going to use for all of her custom dresses and completely pivoted and has been making like organic cotton, high quality masks for, um, if she can get donations, she'll donate them to all the healthcare workers. And then she's selling them to anyone around the country who wants to buy them to be able to fund her retail space and stay open. I love that. Well, and I ordered my masks from. I from ordered her, them too. Which, Me which too. They're really wait. cute. I can't I know. wait. Yeah, they're. Well, really, I just got mine. It's great. And I have another amazing example. I have a friend. She owns Mimosa Handcrafted, which is an amazing jewelry store. And what she's done is she's created these. She's created these little rings that she calls hug rings. And so every time you buy a hug ring, she has different categories. So you can buy one hug ring for a certain amount of money and some of the proceeds go to actually feed some of those um because she's in um, she's pretty near new orleans so the the like service workers who are on the front lines so it's actually mm. paying to feed them um, you can buy um you can spend another amount of money and send a hug to a friend and then some of the money goes there and so she's really she's really seen those orders just pour in as a result of that pivot that's awesome so these are examples of businesses that are acting, right? They're making, yeah. they're mm-hmm. taking action. They're not letting the market, like being a victim about what's going on, but they're actually taking action as to what's going on. And then you can see so many of them making a difference in the world through this, making masks and um, th- things like that. That's been, it's been, it's, it inspires me watching so yeah, many yes. business owners right now uh, uh, doing that. I know one of the things that we ran into it was, our, IS, our inside sales team is still very much on the phone, still having conversations with people. And we ran into people just stopped like showing up virtually and also, of course, in person. And that was a big issue. Uh, we went from having about 70% will show up to now uh, we ran into like 20% show up. And so we had to pivot to now we're doing on-demand consultations. Um, so we have uh, agents that are on standby, basically, that can get loop in to someone that's looking to buy and sell, buy or sell a home right away. Um, and so just finding different ways to take action, d- depending on what's going on around us, right? Uh, so many awesome examples on that. The other thing I was going to say too, though, is I think what's important that I'm hearing from all of these different stories is it's not that we just took what we were doing yesterday and moved it online and said, it's virtual, like that's not going to work. You know, when you when you hear these examples and stories, it was taking it was taking what you were doing pivoting and then applying virtual or online offering on top of that. Like Julie at Harkins Beck, if she just started selling her dresses online for $200, that's not going to keep her alive in business, right? And so I love hearing your example of how you've completely pivoted and 
changed what you were doing and how you were doing it in your business and then taken the virtual aspect layered on top of that. It wasn't that you just said, oh, well, now we call it virtual and it works because that's not going to that's not going to do the trick. So I'm curious. I mean, that's you bring up a really good point, Seychelle, and I'm curious, are there any things that you guys have done to pivot in a business that you think you're going to continue to do after this, right? That are going to stick and be permanent? I love that buyers can make so many pieces of decisions with proper information. Like if we actually as an industry take it as a real estate industry, right? Take the time to do the proper due diligence up front and give that full information for them. We believe that somebody can make 90 to 95% of their decision without having to walk into a home. Instead of needing to see five or seven or 10 or 20 or 50 houses, depending on which real estate consultant you work with, why should you only like you should only be able to see one or two and you have all of the information to make the decision before you walk in the door. And I love that. That's something we've completely changed in how we're doing business. And I don't think we're going to go back from that. Well, yeah, I love that. And I think that it's nice to be able to give your customers options, right? There might still be some people out there who want to do that. But I think about our virtual open houses that we're doing. So we did, um, you know, right when this all started, we pivoted and did a virtual open house. We got two open houses done in 60 minutes or less, including the drive time. And by the end of the day, we had 1,300 views. And I just compared that to the old-fashioned way of doing an open house, which is putting your signs in the yard. That takes an hour. A three-hour open house takes 30 minutes to take the signs down. And, you know, we're thrilled if 10 people come through the door. And Mm -hmm. so moving forward, for sure, we're going to give our sellers a choice. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, do you want to do the virtual open house where you only have to be out of your house for for 15 minutes? And then we'll host a virtual open house every single week until it sells and you don't even ever have to leave. Or we could do it the old-fashioned way where for every Sunday from now until the house sells, you got to leave for five hours. Right? It's customer service. Mm -hmm. So all all of these are big changes in our business, right? And I know I'm I'm backtracking, but what I don't want our listeners to miss is something that Via brought up, which is getting buy-in from our teams. So now that we've mm-hmm. now that we've sort of talked about some ways that other businesses are pivoting as well as we've pivoted, let's go back and talk about how do we get buy-in when we're wanting to change something, change the way we're doing it. I I know for our business, we use the IDS model, which is to identify what the problem is, discuss the problem, and then solve it. And we're we're doing that to get the buy-in from our leadership team to make sure that we're discussing it all together. What are some other ways when we are wanting to implement some pivoting changes that we can get buy-in? You know, Sarah, I'm so glad you brought that up. Thanks thanks for, for reeling me back there. It, it reminds me, though, in order for you to do IDS or for anybody to do IDS, that, that there is some, I think, some basic communication uh, tenets that we have to have, right? In fact, I think that's going to be our next episode. And, and I think what works for you and for a lot of us that are running businesses doing uh, frameworks like IDS is that especially in the time of crisis, we are very visible right now to our teams. We are highly, highly communicative, right? We are um, constantly doing one-on-ones, small groups, large group sessions right now. Yes, they're on Zoom and phone, but we're still, we're we're very purposeful about doing those right now. And I think that has to come in with buy-in because what I've learned in my years in leadership is that people want to be heard. They want their voice to be heard. They're okay, ultimately, with a dissenting opinion And they're probably okay going forward with the directive if they feel like they had input and they were really listened to. And so I I think that when we talk about any framework, we even have to go back upstream even more and talk about that and talk about, you know, do you have enough communication and and enough frequent communication channels going with your crew? The part that I love about that too, Via, is that by being more present in our businesses right now, you're earning social capital and trust. Mm-hmm. And that's allowing you to communicate more effectively with your people and ultimately get buy-in on the decision. And if we're not present and engaged and including people in those decisions, it's going to feel like a dictatorship or an authoritative regime instead of like a democracy, right? And I think it's really important that we understand that if we have people that are working with us in our businesses that we have trusted with our businesses before, including them and giving them all the information that you're looking at, 
and allowing them to have input, a lot of times they're probably going to have a better idea than we could have come up with on our own anyways. Well, and I think it's also, I know in our organization, it's forcing us to consider the way we do solve problems. You know, we can't just walk into the other room and just spitball about it and chit chat about it. It's like there has to be more of a a framework uh, in our organization to help solve some of these things. And so for me personally, that's been great just to see that from the inside out. And then the other thing that I think is so important is we're really seeing who's on our team. Yes. You know, yes. it's, uh, it's like, who who's on your team? Is it, do you have uh, people on your team who are willing to pivot, who are pitching in, who are kind of going all in? And I know for me, I have a relatively young team. Uh, it's been amazing to see how my team has just really stood up and really helped move everything forward and really just doing things that are not their job. Yes. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. I remember when the first uh, team meeting that I had when this all went down, started going down, I sort of did like a state of the company, like an address to uh, to the team. And I actually just asked them, I said, if it, right now as a leader, I need to know that everyone is behind me because I'm going to have to make some decisions. We're going to have to move fast. If you're one foot in and one foot out, I'm asking you to resign today. And it was a hard conversation, but also the team appreciated it because when you're about to enter into basically a a huge storm and you know you're going into the storm, we need everyone on our teams to be all in. And if they're not, they should go join another team, right? They should go follow a leader that they can get all in with. Um, And just directly asking people, right? And and it's it's been beautiful to see people that never were involved in certain aspects of our business all of a sudden be involved. And uh, we've been leaning into our strengths through like strength finders and like tying in some, tying in different people and what they're good at um, in terms of uh, like communication, for example, all the people that are good with communication, making sure that we're, our messaging is good, stuff like that. So leaning into strengths as we get through this as well. Yeah, that's great. Well, and again, I would ask the question, you know, what do, what do people do if they have a small team, right? You know, it's great to have a team with a lot of resources and it helps you pivot. You know, what are some ways that um, people who maybe run an organization of three people or five people, like what can they do when they're just struggling to maybe like manage the, the workflow? You know, I don't think it looks different, Wendy. I don't think it looks different. I think that we are still pouring into our people, whether it's 3, 30, or 300, or 3,000. And it's being very visible, letting them know what you're doing, why you're doing it. You know, this is the time for massive transparency. In fact, I, I would argue this is a time for almost over-transparency. They, they, we, we have to make sure our people understand how serious this is and how hard the road ahead is going to be. We can't sugarcoat it too much. So I don't, I don't think it, for me, I don't think the framework changes necessarily, even, even for a team of one, even if it's just yourself. You know, are you being transparent with yourself? Are you facing reality? Are you really facing reality? Are you, are you avoiding certain things, right? Well, and I, I love that because, you know, in a way, for those of us that have larger organizations, it's a way to get back and be that like brand new entrepreneur again. And I know, I know all of you guys are definitely like struggling with it, but in a way, it's, it's a little bit energizing and exciting because you get to be back at the beginning and putting those building blocks together instead of just, just being in maintenance mode, you know? Uh, you know, the other piece too that um, I appreciate is uh, in um, the book called Shift that Gary Keller and Jay Papasan wrote, one of the things they talk about is like not doing business for business sake, right? And sometimes doing business just for business sakes can actually cost you a lot of time and money right now. And so we get to have freedom in our businesses to take a look and say, you know, we've always done it this way, but is that actually the best way to do business? And it's forcing us to slow down with some of those pieces and make critical decisions and eliminate some redundant processes and systems and ways we were doing things. So now that we can sprint forward and speed up, not just through this, but long after. And that to me is really exciting that we get to look at businesses that way again. That brings me to a thought that I was reading uh, the other day, which are the businesses that started during the last uh, Great Recession 
And um, one of the commonalities amongst the businesses have, have been that they pivoted. They saw an area of opportunity. They got um, input from those that they led. And then they've started amazing companies. I know WhatsApp started during the Great Recession. Uh, Venmo started during the Great Recession. Uh, Groupon and Instagram all were companies that actually were startups during the last... Uh, Great recession, and I think that that's has been beautiful to see to look back and see these really successful companies, and how it's it's inspired me to be like, okay, what am I doing to be like they did then to sort of reinvent? What does this look like now? Let's reinvent the way that we do business. Well, and I'd go back even further, um, and and I was doing that same research, but I went all the way back, and you know, Thomas Edison launched General Electric. Right as the nation was heading into the panic of 1893, uh, which was a period of 16 months where business activity dropped nearly 40% across the nation. Um, Walt Disney launched right at the start of the Great Depression. And his whole mindset around it was like, people need to laugh right now. People need to be happy right now. And he took advantage of that um, opportunity where uh, people were feeling really despondent. Um, and I mean, that list goes on and on. IBM got its start in June of 1911, uh, which was another recession. GM started in a recession. And the reality is, is that every opportunity you know, that presents itself has risk attached, right? And there's opportunity in every single market. And our goal here is to of course, understand what's going on around us, but then see the opportunity, right? And of course, there's risk there. There's there's always risk, but but in any opportunity, there's risk. And so for us as entrepreneurs, we get to go out and we get to we get to look at the opportunity around us. And then ideally, what will happen, you know, I know that in um during the last re- recession, Keller Williams, before it started, was number four. You know, in terms of real estate agents, and what they did is is they saw it as an opportunity. They saw the market shift as an opportunity, and so instead of holding up, they put the pedal to the metal and emerged on the other side of that as number one. And all of us with that mindset have that opportunity, and and that's going to happen because people are naturally going to quit. No matter what industry you're in right now, there's going to be restaurants that go away. There's going to be retailers that don't show up again. There's going to be lots of real estate agents that never, ever, ever come back. But all that business is still going to be there. So if we can stick around, right, pivot, look at the opportunity, and then emerge on the other side, there's no way that we can't take market share just by staying, just by staying around. So... I love the energy that I get from you in talking about that because really what you're talking about is coming out on the other side of this, we get to choose if we are going to be a better version of our business and a better version of ourselves because we chose to pivot and to plan and to make smart decisions during this process, which is what this whole episode is about, right? So that we can emerge on the other side an even stronger version. You know, that reminds me, Seychelle, that the focusing question that I've been asking myself every single day over the last month since this crisis started is, what do I want the end of this to be the beginning of for me? What do I want the end of this to be the beginning of for me personally, for our business? You know, what do I want? What do I want this to turn us into? Because I'm actually really excited and encouraged about what this is forcing us to become. Absolutely. Via that, that's such a great way to end this podcast. And honestly, this was amazing. I got so many uh, gold nuggets from you guys today. Just, just to recap, uh, we went over how to really plan and pivot during this time. And really, the what we talked about is taking action, right? And all the companies that have taken action uh, through difficult times, and they turned hardship into opportunity, both small businesses, as well as we've seen uh, major businesses take um, some obstacles and turn them into opportunity. Well, this was so, so great. So thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you join us on the next one. See you next time, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.